There's a lot to be said about timing in wrestling. And we're not talking about the timing of moves here, rather we're talking about picking the right time to push a wrestler, as if you wait too long it might not work out. But similarly, if you push a superstar before they're ready, you can have the same problem. But just who are the biggest examples of wrestlers that were pushed too soon? Well that's exactly what we're going to be looking at right now, starting with Roman Reigns. Yes, while the Tribal Chief is the best thing going today, and fans now love him, it hasn't always been this way. Sure, he always had the raw talent within him to be a megastar, something his current success as the biggest name in the entire industry has proven, but we'd be lying if we said he was always a hit with the audience. No, while Roman may have gotten over as part of The Shield during the early to mid 2010s, once he went solo in 2014, things changed. And the reason for that was because it seems Vince McMahon insisted on pushing him right to the top of the card, even though many people thought he wasn't ready for this spot yet. So it was then that we got one of the greatest incidences of audience backlash ever when millions of fans spent the better part of a decade booing the big dog in an attempt to let Vince McMahon know he wasn't the guy they wanted, at least not yet. Sure, it's true that the audience would end up loving Roman eventually, but that was after he'd grown into the role of top guy when he'd turned heel and developed his head of the table character in 2020. Prior to this, however, it seemed like it was a little too much too soon for the NOIE family member. It wasn't his fault though. No, he was just doing the job he'd been tasked with doing. But so badly did this one go over at the time, it almost killed his chances of ever being as beloved as he is today. Yes, there is a danger to pushing someone too fast, and that danger is any hopes they have of being a main event level force can be snuffed out completely. Just look at the sad case of our next subject, Jack Swagger. Now we're not going to say that Jack Swagger was ever going to be the next John Cena exactly, but he certainly had potential to do more in the WWE during the late 2000s and early 2010s. After all, he was everything WWE were looking for in a star at this point, as he was a big guy with a genuine athletic background. So why did he fail to ever really reach the level that was expected of him? Well, it seems it was because he was pushed too fast. That's right, rather than let Swagger gradually hone his craft and develop in the mid-card for a while, all before finally getting pushed to the top when he was ready, Vince McMahon instead decided to fast-track the future Bellator star right to the main event scene when he had him win the Money in the Bank contract in 2010. And you all know what happened after that. Jack went on to successfully cash in mere months later to become World Heavyweight Champion and de facto face of SmackDown, something which we all quickly realized was not going to work out. Why was that? Well, by then it was apparent that Jack Swagger just wasn't World Champion material at this time. And this meant his subsequent time in the spotlight would flop hard and lead to him gaining a reputation as one of the worst ever holders of the big gold belt. Would things have been different if WWE had waited a little bit longer to pull the trigger with him? It's certainly possible, as he's always had the potential within him to be great. Yes, the sad fact is whether he could have made it following a few more years of experience or not, this is unfortunately the way it all went down for him. That said, for as bad as Jack Swagger's run with the World Heavyweight title was, there's another superstar who's often considered to have had an even worse run with that belt, and that person is our next subject, the Great Khali. That's right, if you go through all of the world champions in the WWE's history and rank them best to worst, there's a good chance the Great Khali is going to end up near the bottom of the pile. And that's because when he became champion in 2007, he had one of the worst runs in memory. But then to be fair to him, it wasn't like this was all his fault. No, the truth is, there was little chance he was ever going to make this a success so early on in his career, so it begs the question why he was ever booked as champ to begin with. Lest we forget, this was a man who, while undeniably visually impressive with his massive physique, was still only a few years into his career by then, and certainly not at the level yet where he could reasonably be asked to carry a company on his back. And sure, you could argue he never got to that point in the end, so it didn't matter when he became champion, but making him the top guy so early on only shone a brighter light on his shortcomings. Yes, the reality is that this was yet another example of Vince McMahon falling in love with someone's size, as with Kali being 7 foot 1 in height, the boss just couldn't help but see money when he looked at him. The only problem with this though was that, while in the 80s such a thing might have worked out, by the time the Ruthless Aggression era was in full effect, wrestling fans were more interested in watching great in-ring performances as well as the spectacle that goes along with it. 
So it was that once the Dorena native won a battle royal to take home the gold for the first time then, many fans were turned off by the move, with them largely being disinterested when the giant came out through the curtain thereafter. And this, sadly, was something that would stick with the great Kali for the rest of his run going forward. Sure, if you went to his home country of India, he would be treated like a huge superstar, but back in America, he was still seen as that guy who WWE had hoped was going to be the next Andre the Giant, but partially as a result of him being rocketed to the top of the card way too soon, this just never worked out. But what about our next subject? A superstar who came along a few years later in 2011, and another performer who ended up being hamstrung on account of being pushed too fast. That's right, it's time to talk about Sin Cara. That's right, whether we're talking about the original Sin Cara or the second replacement version, they were both very good wrestlers. In fact, if we're specifically talking about the first version, that was played by Mystico, one of the greatest wrestlers in the world, and the man who stands today is probably the biggest star in all of Mexico. So why did Sin Cara fail to make this level of an impact in WWE? Well, because whichever version we're talking about, they were pushed way too fast. And we say this because, especially in the case of the original Sin Cara, he needed to adapt to the WWE style if he was ever going to have any chance of getting over. Yes, Lucha Libre is very high-paced and can often go a mile a minute, and while this has turned that version of wrestling into a cultural phenomenon south of the border, with CMLL shows in particularly regularly selling out Arena Mexico on a weekly basis, it's not the same way things are done in the US. So when Sin Cara joined WWE in 2011 then, and there initially tried to work his usual style, he quickly found that it wasn't meshing with everyone else on the roster. Could he have eventually adapted had he been given enough time to do so? Perhaps in a developmental brand where less eyes could see him? Possibly. But instead of this happening, it was decided that WWE would go all in with the Sin Cara gimmick right out of the gate and push it to the moon on SmackDown as the company desperately wanted to find their next top star. And unfortunately, this turned out to be a mistake, because after the original version of The Masked Star quickly gained a reputation for botching on account of initial difficulty working the US style, it was decided that a new wrestler would take over the gimmick instead, this time being played by the former Unico, with him never reaching the heights the gimmick was initially intended to. So it should come as no surprise then that the Sin Cara character failed to ever really get over in WWE, even when it was given two chances at doing so. But let's move away from the PG era for a moment and back to the golden days of the Attitude Era, as even back then there were stars being pushed way too hard, way too early, stars such as our next subject, The Rock. Yes, believe it or not, despite him being one of the biggest stars in all of wrestling history today, there was a time when Dwayne Johnson felt like he was being pushed down fans' throats, and that time was throughout late 1996 and most of 1997. What happened then? Well, after signing the future Hollywood star to a contract and feeling like he was their next big thing, WWF went all in with him right away, way before he was ready. That's right, like with his cousin Roman Reigns, while The Rock would eventually become everything Vince McMahon had hoped he'd become, his initial push to the moon happened way too soon. And for that reason, it didn't take fans of the proto Attitude era long to turn on the Great One and rain down booze on him whenever he came out through the curtain. Hell, so bad would things get, there would even be signs reading Die Rocky Die seen in the audience on episodes of Raw. So how did things turn around for the People's Champion then? Well again, like with his cousin, a heel turn would be the solution to the problem, as while well, no one was interested in the bland smiling babyface who initially started out with WWF, they were far more into the cocky heel who he became by the time 1997 was over. And after he did that, it was off to the races, as The Rock became a megastar, the likes of which is very rarely seen in wrestling, which makes it all the wilder that he came so close to never getting over it all. But we guess it just goes to show you that WWE were right all along on this one, and it was maybe just a case of bad timing with his initial push. But what about our next subject? Someone who came around in the ruthless aggression era, that being none other than the masterpiece, Chris Masters. Now, if you were watching Raw during the mid-2000s, then you'll no doubt remember Chris Masters. But for those who weren't, he was basically WWE's attempt at creating a new superstar in the vein of Lex Luger. Hell, he even had the same early heel narcissist character that Luger had upon joining WWF in the early 90s, with his whole gimmick being that he was better than everyone on account of how shredded he was. 
Could this have led to big things for him? Perhaps even world title success? Sure, there's no reason it couldn't have, as he had all the potential in the world to make it to the very top of the card and maybe even win a world title. But alas, things didn't work out that way for the masterpiece, and a big part of the reason for this was because he was pushed too hard, too fast. Really, given how inexperienced he was back then, what Masters could have used was some time working his way up the roster and learning the ropes at a slower pace. But with Vince McMahon taking one look at his physique and being unable to wait any longer, he decided to fast-track the Santa Monica native and give him a role he wasn't fully ready for. Yes, before his first year on the main roster was over, the heel was already going after the WWE title in programs against John Cena. And rather than shine him in the light of a future superstar, what this did was show his inexperience. So perhaps it should come as little surprise then that this ended up causing Masters to fall back down the card again in short order as the Masterpiece experiment was ultimately deemed a disappointment at this time. Of course, it also didn't help his case that when WWE began implementing a new drug testing policy in the wake of Eddie Guerrero's passing, he also mysteriously lost a lot of his muscle, with this even being pointed out on screen by Triple H on an episode of Raw. Yes, now without a huge eye-catching physique to help him weather the storm, Chris Masters found his time in the spotlight coming to an unceremonious end, so much so that by 2007, he'd be gone from the company entirely. But Masters wasn't the only person struggling to live up to the weight of Vince McMahon's expectations at this point in time. No, while this was happening to him on Raw, over on SmackDown, a very similar story was playing itself out with our next subject, Drew McIntyre. Yes, we know that today, Drew McIntyre has been able to turn things around and become one of the best things about WWE overall. But it took a long time for the Scotsman to reach this level, and a large part of the reason for that is because during his initial run with the promotion back in the late 2000s and early 2010s, he was pushed way too fast. After all, while he certainly had all the raw skills required to become a major name once he debuted there in 2007, the fact he was almost immediately saddled with the heavy weight of being labeled Vince McMahon's chosen one meant there was a lot more attention given to him than was merited. So because of this then, someone who was still acclimatizing to the ways of the WWE system got critiqued for not being yet good enough to be given the label he'd been given. And this meant instead of slowly working his way up the card and becoming a world champion, Drew instead ended up falling down to the role of comedy jobber as part of 3MB. Yes, it was quite a fall and one which arguably only happened because, like with so many other people, he was pushed way too fast. Seriously, given what we know about how great Drew McIntyre is today, this has to rank as one of Vince McMahon's worst fumbles of the era. Fortunately for the Iron Native, though, at least he was able to overcome this false start by building his name back up in smaller promotions like TNA and then returning to WWE as the star we all knew he could be. So things worked out, with this being evident in his spot as arguably Raw's top heel today. And Drew McIntyre isn't the only one who was able to have such a journey from disappointment to main event success, as the exact same thing would happen around the same time with our next subject, Bobby Lashley. Yes, the stories of the Almighty and the Scottish Psychopath are so similar that, at a distance, they could almost be that of the same person. After all, like with Drew, it was in the mid-2000s that Lashley first joined the WWE roster and was, from there, quickly pegged as a future top guy. Hell, so enamored were WWE management with the Kansas City native during his early days there, after a quick introduction on the WWE CW roster, he'd be rushed into a feud with Vince McMahon himself over the ECW world title, a feud which eventually saw the rookie get involved in a semi-main event spot at WrestleMania 23. Unfortunately though, this did not lead to Bobby becoming the top guy everyone hoped he would, at least not at that point in time. No, in the end, all it did was prove that he wasn't yet ready for the spot as he was still too green. And that caused his momentum to stall somewhat and his job satisfaction to plummet to the point that, come 2008, he'd be gone altogether. Of course, as we all know now though, the big man would return to WWE later on following his successful run in TNA, and with this run reviving both his stock and his passion for the industry, he would go on from there to become a multiple-time world champion in WWE. So thankfully everything worked out for him in the end, but it's crazy to think how close we all came to never seeing him reach his potential, purely because, like with all the other people we've looked at today, he was rocking it up the card too quickly. Still, it should be reiterated that it did work out for Bobby Lashley by the time all was said and done. It's just a shame the same can't be said about our next subject then, 
a man who for a brief period in 2008 felt like he might be SmackDown's next big thing, Vladimir Kozlov. Yes, it might sound ridiculous to make that statement today with hindsight being 2020. After all, the idea of Vladimir Kozlov ending up on the level of other blue brand stalwarts like Edge and Eddie Guerrero seems ludicrous when you think about it. But back in the late 2000s, this looked like it might be the case. That's not to say he had no talent, of course. No, there was certainly something there, and if he'd been given enough time to grow, he might have discovered how to develop his skills fully. But on account of Vince McMahon getting itchy feet when it came to pushing him to the moon, any hopes Kozlov had of developing at his own pace were destroyed when he was quickly put in a main event program with Triple H and Jeff Hardy, and there left to flounder. But then why wouldn't he flounder? Again, this was still very much a rookie we were talking about here, someone who had only been wrestling for two years at this point, and so it should come as no surprise that he'd be exposed when put up against far more experienced opponents. We weren't talking about a once-in-a-lifetime prodigy like Kurt Angle, no, we were talking about someone who needed a lot more time than that. But time was not on Vladimir Kozlov's side back then, and so this led to his main event push being aborted pretty quickly, with it only being once he fell back down the card that he found his role as a more of a comedy sidekick to Santino Morella, someone who could play the straight man to the wacky kayfabe battalion whenever he was partaking in his usual antics. Could he have been more than this if things had worked out differently? Maybe. But we'll never know the true answer to that question. One question we do know the answer to, though, is what would become of our next subject after his own failed push in WWE, a man who was at one point pegged to be the next breakout star, Alberto Del Rio. Yes, on the face of things, Alberto Del Rio seemed to have everything required to be a major main event player in WWE. After all, he had the physique, the promo ability, great in-ring work, and the cocky heel character down pat. But despite all signs seeming to point towards him being a shoe-in for success, things never really worked out that way after the Mexican debuted in 2010. Why was this? Well, part of the reason was because he was given too much too soon. That's right, this is yet another example of a wrestler being pushed before they were ready and, as a result, having their legs cut out from under them. Not that Alberto Del Rio didn't have any success at all, of course. No, he was actually a multiple-time WWE champion during the early 2010s, but maybe because there was a sense he was being pushed down fans' throats at the expense of other more popular stars like CM Punk, he never really connected in a way that made him the company's next top Latino star. Yes, fans just never really took to Del Rio no matter how many titles he won, and after his run in the main event scene was over, he would ultimately end up falling down the card and do things like join the League of Nations stable, all before exiting the company in the mid-2010s. That's right, Alberto Del Rio has to be included as an example of someone who was pushed way too fast, as if he was given a little more time to establish himself before winning the big one, he might have been able to keep his position at the top of the card instead of feeling like a short-term success.